How do you create a sound for something that doesn't exist? We, we were desperate not to have the audience feel like it sounded like a helicopter. Say you're Oscar-winning sound designer Mark Mangini, and you get tasked with designing the sound of the ornithopters, these strange flying crafts from the world of Dune. The sound of a real-world helicopter seems like the logical starting place. And those were the early experiments we played with, but everything that landed on the picture felt like it was a helicopter. So we needed to kind of divorce ourselves from believable or realistic technology and, and go in another direction. But this job gets even more complicated because... All of them were made, believe it or not, out of traditional organic acoustic sounds. We used very, very little electronic or synthetic sound in this film. Out of 3,500 bespoke sounds that we made, only three or four were made with synthesizers. Part of Denis' pitch to us was that he wanted Dune to sound like a documentary as if we had landed on Arrakis with a boom pole and a recorder and everything you heard would sound like or feel like what you'd expect it to sound like. So whatever sound you're creating for the ornithopters, you have to use real world recordings as your starting place. One of the things I find magical about sound design is the often beautifully abstract winding path sound designers might take to get to the end result. How did Pablo Picasso find a way to make a portrait out of squares and circles? Those abstract impressionists found ways to create art with objects that weren't what they were trying to express, but found a way to mold them to do just that. Sound designers, we think in ab abstract ways, and our brains have been trained over the years to find abstractions of what we want and, and, and create associations this is how our sound designer brains think. Recently, I got the chance to chat with Mark Mangini, who, besides Dune, has worked on Blade Runner 2049, Mad Max Fury Road, and a bunch of other incredible sounding movies. We talked about the art of sound design, recording, and he and his co-sound designer Theo Green's collaboration with director Denis Villeneuve. I asked him what one of his most satisfying recent creations was, and he told me about what went into making the sound of the ornithopters. The really the operative sounds that we built the ornithopters out of, for their, certainly their propulsion system, are cat purrs. And we had this idea that cat purring had that fluttering sound, and we were desperate to create a fluttering because it's wings, it's not a rotor. Yeah. We also recorded a live beetle and captured its fluttering wings. And the real meat of the flapping is the sound of a canvas strap of a tent in a, in a hundred mile an hour wind so it's going and then it was a process of manipulating that very steady state sound so that it could accelerate decelerate pass by with doppler shift and uh, and cruise at altitude so it was taking these actually three very steady state sounds that had very little dynamics in them and building them and shaping them to match the action of the ornithopters. They sound great and it's it's so immediately believable. Like it just sounds like, oh, that's what that's what they sound like. There's no ah, you stretch said the of the imagination. Oh, you, you, you just <laughs> you just made a best friend. <laughs> to hear from someone who doesn't know how we did it or what we did to say, oh, that's exactly what it should sound right. like. Yeah. When we achieve that, that's that's nirvana. I mean, yes. I, I win. <laughs> we can end this interview now. Sound design doesn't just deliver dialogue and sound effects for what's happening on screen. It has so much potential as a storytelling device. All while it can disappear and feel almost inseparable from what we're seeing. Dune and Blade Runner 2049 are two of my favorite sounding films ever. There's so much interesting, luscious, dense sound design without it feeling overbearing and in a way that always expands our understanding of the world of those films. Often sound 
in an instant can say something about a character, a situation, a scene, have dramatic import in ways that exposition is less efficient with. I was fascinated by this idea of the ambient soundscape being able to act as exposition. But what does that even look like? We'll get to an example in a moment, but for now, bear with me while I nerd out about one aspect of this kind of sound design I find really cool. The background ambient soundscape for a scene is one area of sound design that the audience is almost never going to consciously notice. But there's still a lot of care and artistry that goes into even this seemingly minuscule part of a scene. If you've never done this kind of sound design before, you might assume that if you have a scene that happens in a city, you can just slap some city ambience on the scene and call it a day. But if you're trying to find background sound that sounds believable for the scene, you'll quickly find it's a little more complicated than that. Listen how different the sound of Los Angeles is compared to the sound of New York. The kinds of sounds that exist in the environment, like types of transportation or birds, are different from location to location. But also the landscape itself, the height and shape of the buildings, affects the way the noises in the environment sound. In a place like New York, there's a lot more reverb because the sound is literally trapped inside the skyscrapers bouncing around. But even within a single city, where you're located is going to affect the sound as well. New York from the perspective of the street is going to sound very different from New York from the perspective of an elevated apartment window. Naturally, if you're working on a scene that's set in a real world location, you can just go to that city and record actual ambience from that place or you can pull one from a sound library. But what if you're creating an ambient soundscape for a fictional world like the ones we see in Dune and Blade Runner 2049? In these cases, you get to design an ambient soundscape and that presents a unique storytelling opportunity. Mark used this scene from Blade Runner 2049 as an example of what that can actually look like. Connect to off-world anytime, anyplace. We knew from the script, the lower class lived on the lower floors, and as you moved up in height, you had to spend more money to live higher and higher and higher above those of lesser means below you. So when you start out in the, the bottom floor of that building, the atmospheric sounds are, are very cacophonous. There's adverts blaring at you, commercials and horns honking and the equivalent of futuristic traffic like you would hear in any big city. But by the time you get to the top floor, you are not hearing any of that cacophony. And in fact, you are being importuned by these very languid, soft-spoken Korean adverts beckoning you to some like spa or something, something that would be expensive and reassuring and, and peaceful. And, and everything in between, and Kay who lives somewhere above the ground floor, but below the upper floor, had something in the middle where you heard a small amount of city-like futuristic traffic flying by through a muted window. Um, you heard some of those public address announcements, but much more peaceful than the ones you heard on the ground floor. We built a universe with sound that has an internal logic to it that we try to stick to to help um, further the story ideas. Yeah. Our ear's ability to pick up on these tiny details in a sound even when we're not consciously thinking about it is a big part of why the Dune sound team stayed away from synthesized sound. There are a number of embedded cues in everything that we hear in normal life because everything that we hear lives in an acoustic universe. Every sound we hear bounces off a tree, bounces off the street, bounces off your nose as you speak. The moment the brain decodes those embedded cues, the brain checks a box that says real. Anything in this movie, like cat purrs and tent flaps, etc. we put a microphone on something, captured it as the ear would hear it, then did some subtle manipulation. We slowed it down, we changed its pitch, we modified it somehow in its envelope to turn it into something that you didn't recognize. But those subtle oral cues are still embedded in them because they are acoustic sounds. 
is that a normal thing to be able to go and do so much recording um, for a film like that? Or was that more unique to that film? The goal for anyone with integrity in sound is to record as much fresh new sound as possible. If you went to see a blockbuster movie and you saw a stock shot, right. something you thought you had seen in a TV commercial, it would pull you out immediately. So too, but less obviously, um, in sound, do we strive to create new sounds, even though, you know, if I needed the sound of footsteps on sand, I could go to a library. All good sound designers endeavor to record as much as possible so that the movie is as bespoke and original as possible. But I have yet to be, and I'm, I'm one of the luckiest on the planet. I work on some of the biggest movies with some of the, you know, the largest budgets, but I've never been on a film and I don't know anyone who has, who has been able to record everything. Right, from right. So we must rely on sound libraries at some point. I, I don't mean to throw any shade on that idea because sometimes I may want to record something new, but I can't. Sometimes I rely on my sound library to find those raw elements that I will build into something else. Right. Mark has been developing his own sound library with his partner Richard Anderson for 42 years, and you can actually look through this and license sounds through Pro Sound Effects. They were gracious enough to give me some credit so I could look around and explore the library. And it's fascinating to listen to a lifetime of recordings from someone who's at the top of their game in this industry. And I've been using sound effects and soundscapes from Mark's collection in this video. But of course, the bespoke sounds, you know, you, right. I, I don't sell the sounds of worms and spinners. <laughs> and right. that, that's against the rules. <laughs> yeah. I play the rules. <laughs> For now, if you want that, uh, you know, you'll have to go, people will have to go record their own cats per right. Yeah, and build it, build it yourself. Yes. <laughs> One of the things I love about both Blade Runner 2049 and Dune is the way the soundscape and the score sometimes seem to blend together. You can't tell where one ends and where the other starts. Instead of competing with each other, they feel like they're working together to accomplish a common goal. Mark said that this has a lot to do with Denis' unique approach to sound. Denis empowers the sound designers to think musically, and he empowers the composer to think sonically. But you can't do that willy-nilly. Yeah. You can't just send everybody off on their own and do everything for everything. There has to be a direction to it, and this is where a, you know, a brilliant director like Denis or a George Miller, there's a, a number of directors thinking very intelligently like this, know how to orchestrate that so it has its um, greatest effect when you get to the final mix. In a scene like this, the music and the sound design each have such an intensity that it feels like it easily could have become a muddled mess. But instead, these elements are all beautifully working together. There aren't very many moments on his films where we're recording the sound at the very end in the final mix, and he says, I don't like that rumbly thing. I don't like that screechy thing. It, it, with most other filmmakers, you'd get to that, that sequence with the spinner crashed on, the, on the, the seawall and waves and Hans Zimmer and all of that, <laughs> and you would have been digging out of that for weeks, trying to figure out, what's my point of view? What do I want to hear here? When Denis Villeneuve sits at a final mix and we're combining dialogue, music, and effects, we've pretty much roadmapped how that's all going to work long before that so that he's making big, big, like conductor-like moves of, of an orchestra. Yeah. Denis likes to say that by the time he gets to his final mix, all the work that I've done, the sound design, have become what he calls old friends. Denis heard all the sounds, he's heard the score with the composer, and now he's very gently conducting to guide us through it. Just as important as sound design's relationship to the score is sound design's relationship to the edit. Sound has such an influence on the edit that I know a lot of editors who do temporary sound design while they're editing. 
But Mark told me that Denis involves the sound team earlier on in the process so that it can work together with the edit and in some cases even allowed the sound design to influence the visual effects. The tradition has been you conceptualize a shot, the worm's gonna breach the desert here and it's gonna travel over here and then it's gonna go dig back into the sand there and we'll wait six months for that shot. And we don't do any work on that until we finally see some mock-up of the worm do this action. Well, Denis and Joe recognize that sometimes the sound itself, if we build it before the shot is realized, can inform the way the graphic artists actually animate what we're going to see on screen. And we did that a great deal in Dune. And, and, it, and it becomes this very organic process and it gets back us back to that very beautiful thing you said at the very beginning, which was everything that I heard sounded exactly the way it should sound. One of the reasons that that happens is that because all of that is happening organically and symbiotically in ways that are very non-traditional. Sound design usually is ha something that happens after the edit is done, the visual effects are done, often the score is even done, and we don't have any input into how all of that happened. Denis does this a very different way. I think the beauty and artistry of sound design can sometimes get overlooked because it can feel like it plays a more utilitarian role in filmmaking. And sometimes it is, but it can also take on a sort of avant-garde musicality as well. The first meeting I had with Denis Villeneuve, we watched the movie and we're wrapping it, wrapping it up. And he said to Theo and I, I want you to compose with sound. And he meant that in every possible way you can interpret it. This idea of sound itself as music, I think is really interesting and one that Mark Mangini carries into his work. I feel sorry for composers because they only have 12 notes to work with. <laughs> right. I have an unlimited universe of sound to work. That's my palette. Music as most of us traditionally understand it to me is a very constrained and organized version of sound in one little pocket of what is a wardrobe of, of, of sound that can be expressed and heard. My everyday life is spent deconstructing everything that I hear. I'm constantly analyzing what I hear and wondering where it comes from, how distant is it from me, what might be making that sound, how could I mimic that sound, what does it sound like? I'm, I'm always pulling everything, I'm pulling sound apart. Just as a writer pours emotion into every word that's in a screenplay or a script or a book, so too does a sound designer pour those same intentions into the building of sounds. Anytime sound design is fun and is engaging and is immersive. And I don't mean immersive in the technical sense of you have to have speakers around you. I mean immersive much more so in the sense of when we feel immersed in something, we feel fully engaged. The movie has grabbed a hold of us and convinced us of its believability. When sound can do that and capture the audience and make them feel like they are on that alien planet or they're experiencing that emotion with the, the protagonist or that fear, that's really powerful sound design.